probably the most astonishing passage in Job, referred to by apologists which support the claim of the book's scientific accuracy and origin in divine revelation, is the verse which seems to describe the earth as suspended in space. God hangeth the earth upon nothing. Job stands opposed to other mythologies of the ancient world which described the earth as the belly of a beast, or as being lifted upon the shoulders of a great god, or as balanced on the back of an elephant or turtle. However, the verse does not refer to resting the earth upon nothing, but to hanging it, and not necessarily upon nothing, but over nothing, as the NIV and ISV translate the verse. Indeed, the Bible has numerous references to the earth being built upon foundations and being supported by pillars. The ancient Hebrew belief was that the earth was a fixed object, firmly cemented by God in a sturdy foundation, a foundation sunk into a great body of water surrounding it. In fact, Psalm 24 verses 1 and 2 stands in direct contradiction to the apologist assertion that Job 26.7 presupposes a scientifically accurate description of the earth as suspended in space. Psalm 24 states the earth was founded upon the seas. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it, for he has founded it on the seas. The ancient Hebrews had a belief very common among other ancient Near Eastern people, that the earth was flat and surrounded by a vast ocean. Genesis describes the earth as rising out of this enormous expanse of water. God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. It was natural for the ancient Hebrews to imagine the earth itself, the habitable dry land, as having been set upon a firm foundation, sunk into the depths of this expanse of water. Job itself describes this foundation, and the book of Jonah refers to the roots of the mountains, holding up the earth from beneath the sea. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? On what were its bases sunk? The waters closed in over me, the deep surrounded me, weeds were wrapped around my head at the roots of the mountains. Some apologists will try to deflect attention away from these observations regarding ancient Hebrew cosmology as reflected in the scriptures by arguing that the imagery was merely meant to be metaphoric. These apologists will point to other passages, such as Isaiah 55:12, You will go out in joy and be led forth in peace. The mountains and hills will burst into song before you, and all the trees of the field will clap their hands and try to draw a parallel between such clearly metaphoric verses and those describing the heaven and the earth as a domed structure and built upon a foundation, respectively. However, such parallels exist purely in the imaginations of the apologists as part of an agenda to force a particular interpretation out of the text favorable to their worldview. We can reasonably conclude that verses like Isaiah 55:12 are metaphors because it is fairly certain the author responsible for the passage was familiar with hills and trees and that such inanimate objects did not possess independent agency with the capacity to burst into song or clap their hands. However, the same cannot be said of the biblical author's knowledge of the world and the greater universe. Without a doubt, these verses are painting a poetic picture, but what is important is not to lose sight of the fact that the metaphor used is that of a building being constructed and firmly fixed to a flat foundation. What sense does this metaphor make in reference to a spheroid planet suspended upon nothing in empty space? The metaphor works, however, for an ancient concept of the earth as a flat object built upon the foundation of an enormous expanse of water, just as the Bible describes. We have other ancient Near Eastern literature which describes a similar cosmology as that found in the biblical text, and we can be reasonably certain that the ancient biblical authors did not have a modern understanding of the cosmos, unless one is assuming divine revelation in order to prove it, in which case one would be arguing in a circle. So when the Bible speaks of the earth resting on pillars, not just once, but numerous times, and of a solid domed canopy overhead on which were affixed the sun, moon, and stars, 
it is perfectly legitimate to conclude the biblical authors were writing literally about their understanding of the nature of the earth and cosmos. It is clear the author of Job employed Hebrew poetry, and in Hebrew poetry we often find parallelism used, of which we find many examples in the book of Job, and in particular here in Job 26.7. The entire verse reads, He spreads out the northern skies over empty space, he suspends the earth over nothing. In this verse, the spreading of the dome-like sky over empty space is paralleled with the suspension of the earth over nothingness. As John Hartley notes in the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, the book of Job, above the watery chaos, God pitched his tent, the sky, or the firmament. From the edges of the tent's roof on the sky, he hung the earth over nothing that is, over the vast ocean depths. In a sense, the floor of God's tent, the earth, is being pictured as a disk or a plate floating on the deep. Although floating on these deep waters, the land mass is securely supported by being tied to the heavens. In addition, and contrary to this ancient cosmology, the apologists also claim that the book of Job describes a spherical earth. They point to Job 26.10. He has inscribed a circle on the surface of the waters at the boundary of light and darkness. This assertion is dealt with in detail in the four-part documentary, What the Bible Got Wrong, A Flat Earth. But briefly, apologists base their assertion upon the Hebrew word for circle found in this passage, hug. However, hug does not mean spherical but circular, as in the shape of an object drawn on a flat surface with a compass, or as a dinner plate. If the Hebrew author of Job, or the author of any of the other passages in which the earth is described with the word hug that apologists drag up to support their assertion, had wanted to describe the earth as spherical, there was already a perfectly good word in ancient Hebrew for his use, dur. In fact, kadur, the modern Hebrew word for ball, is derived from the biblical dur. Some apologists will point to Job 38 verses 12 through 14 which, they assert, figuratively describes the turning of the earth on its ends or axes. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days, and caused the day spring to know his place, that it might not take hold of the ends of the earth, that the wicked might be shaken out of it? It is turned as clay to the seal, and they stand as a garment. The idea presented by the apologists is that this passage in Job is picturing a revolving earth, like clay being turned or rotated on a potter's wheel. However, this is an awkward misreading of the text. The verse is not equating the earth to clay being spun round on a wheel, but as featureless clay being pressed underneath a seal, raising some portions and depressing others. Other versions of this passage make this very clear. The earth takes shape like clay under a seal. Its features stand out like those of a garment. It is changed as clay under the seal and all things stand forth as a garment. It is changed like clay under the seal, and its features stand out like a garment. Like clay is molded by a signet ring, the earth's hills and valleys then stand out like the colors of a garment. Other scientific insights into the nature of the earth are also found in Job according to the apologists. Erosion is a process by which mountains are reduced to piles of sand by wind and rain, taking millions and millions of years to do so. No one in a single lifetime has ever witnessed rocks weathered away, and only until recent times, in the study of modern geomorphology, have we come to understand the enormous effects of weathering. However, the author of the book of Job, the apologists say, seems to demonstrate knowledge of this global process. Job 14 verses 18 and 19. And surely the mountains falling cometh to naught, and the rock is moved out of his place. The waters wear the stones, 
Thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth. And Job 28, verses 9 and 10. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountains by the roots. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and his eye seeth every precious thing. It is unclear why these observations are particularly unusual for an ancient author, especially one living in a seismically active region of the world. The land of Israel is part of a complex rift system, which stretches from Lebanon in the north to Mozambique in the south. A number of faults cut through much of Israel and the Dead Sea region, and the area was seismically active in the past, as well as it is today. Earthquakes could easily have figured into the ancient author of Job's poetic narrative. Overturning mountains seems a clear, if not hyperbolic, description of such a violent event. The area would have also seen flash floods, which would have washed away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth. As far as water wearing away rocks, not all rocks are as hard as granite and could easily be seen as wearing away in a single lifetime. There certainly is nothing in these passages to suggest remarkable scientific insight which would not have come until the discoveries of modern geology. More remarkable would have been a mention of the enormous age of the earth or of tectonic plate movement. but nothing of the sort can be found in the book of Job. Most apologists arguing for the remarkable scientific accuracy of Job will mention verse 16 of chapter 38. Hast thou entered into the springs of the sea, or hast thou walked in the search of the depth? and conclude from it divine inspiration, insofar as freshwater springs in the sea were not discovered until the 1960s, when metal-rich hot brines were found using sonar in the bottom of the Red Sea. How else could the author of Job have known of such springs? Ancient people did not have bathyspheres to explore the enormous depths of the ocean. Such knowledge must have been supplied by a supernatural intelligence. However, the Hebrew word used for spring in this verse, nevek, comes from a root meaning to burst forth, and thus is more likely to mean the source of the sea in an ancient Hebrew cosmological sense. The ancient Hebrews believed a vast ocean lay beneath the earth. This is reflected in Psalms 24 and 136. For God has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. God spread out the earth above the waters. In the depths of this enormous sea lay not only its source, but also a door leading into the earth's center, Sheol, or the abode of the dead. This is clearly seen in the parallel passage to verse 16, immediately following in verse 17. Have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? So what the author of Job is having God in this first question is whether Job had the power, as the deity does, to visit these remote, dark, and mysterious places beneath the earth, the source of the great sea over which a flat earth was spread, and the dark, shadowy gate leading to the underworld. The oceans do not have their source somewhere buried in their depths, nor is there a gate to the underworld beneath the waves. Job is describing an ancient Hebrew conception of the world, not a modern one. 